So we, we, we don't have much time with you, so let's let's uh, get right into it. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and big round Welcome. of applause for our guest today. Okay. So, um, my first question for you is, uh, what was it like for you growing up in Cape Town, and how did music come into your life? Philadelphia. <laughs> really? Yes, sir. How Philadelphia? The African Methodist Episcopal Church. Really? Yeah. Mother Bethel. Wow. How was, uh, I grew up in, in Cape Town, in a uh, township. Kensington, and my grandmother was the f one of the founding members of the AME Church in mm -hmm. Cape Town. And uh, the, uh, at an early age, I grew up with uh, the music, the AME Church, and Mother Bethel Church here sent uh, missionaries to, to Cape Town, mm. Bishop Gao, Bishop Bonner, In fact, one of, one, of, one of my musicians, Horace Alexander Young, mm -hmm. from uh, uh, Texas, alto player, went with me to South Africa, and there he met some of his descendants. It was a Bishop Young mm -hmm. from Mother Bethel. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they created the Mother Bethel Church in, in Cape Town as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll understand the history of... Uh, of Reverend Richard Allen. So it resonated with us in South Africa in terms of our, of our struggle, which we saw as associates you know, unanimous with what we experienced here. Mm -hmm. So all this, and they intermarried in, in Cape Town. They still extended Bishop Gao's family are still in Cape Town. So that is that is where I. I and it was the my, music. My grandmother was a uh, pianist mm. in, in the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so, piano comes in, or music comes into your life through the church. Uh, what drew you to the piano? It was the only instrument around. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, so at that time, uh, like every second house had a. I had a piano, hmm. and uh, not very good pianos, hmm. but uh, yeah, there was one at home, and I was about five, six years of age, like every kid, I started getting curious and mm -hmm. tinkling on the thing, and then at the age of seven, my grandmother said, okay, you're going to go for piano lessons, <laughs> the local school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, because then there were also traditional traditional uh, pianists. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had house rent parties. Mm -hmm. them, yeah. the, um, that, the, the stride piano experience was exported from the United States to, to South Africa, uh -huh. uh, especially around when diamonds, the discovery of diamonds. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, these uh, Cities or villages grew around the uh, Kimberley, uh, where diamonds were discovered, and so these these camps and uh, uh, little villages grew up. I mean, they emerged with uh, stride piano players and music. Wow! And then the people, are, our musicians, adapted it. And put an African uh, and put, yeah. twist on yeah. it. Wow! Did you ever play any rent parties when you were younger? Or, or yeah, uh, I didn't get paid. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, was was Stride a big influence on your early playing? Did you find yourself doing lots of the? Yeah, I wrote something. I think it was in about nineteen fifties or something. I wrote a, a piece called the Stride. Mm. At the the stride piano was very, very influential, and of course, also the, 
the, the players, the boogie, boogie woogie players mm -hmm. like uh, Albert Ammons, Meatlux Lewis, Pete Johnson, Jimmy Yancey, and they all listen to them. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, with Cape Town being such an international city, so much music coming through there, what drew you to jazz? Well, jazz was an integral part of, a, of our experience. And, uh, my first, the first concert, my first gig that I played was with a big band mm. in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there were, in Cape Town there were two big bands in Johannesburg, there must have been about four or five of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, it was a possibility for a, a young musician and you studied music that uh, this was one of the first places of employment that you could do. The mm -hmm. big bands that we played, played dance music and also traditional music. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, the structure of the music was so incredible because you sometimes you couldn't identify if it was a what was being played, if it was a, a bassy, a bassy riff or it was a, a traditional traditional African African song. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the band, the first big band that I played with in Cape Town was called the Tuxedo Slickers. And our theme song was uh, Tuxedo Junction mm. of Erskine Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So when I arrived in the United States, of one of I went to seek out all these places, came to mm. Mother Bethel, and I went to, where, where did you live, Erskine Hawkins? I went to... But he had passed on already, but I went to his, his, his home mm. in the south. Where was it? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Wow. So tell me how did your, the band with Hugh Masekela come together? How, d how did that band form, and what was that like doing that f those early recordings for you? Well, uh, The settlers always regarded us, as maybe some regards still regard us as either being a subculture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so our music was not supposed to be valid. Uh, so the record companies really didn't want to, they want to deal with it because uh, they, in some quarters, jazz music is, uh, and so I laughing about it. It was considered to be decadent because it came from a so-called decadent society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, there was no mention about how the society became decadent. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you such it. <laughs> to yeah, so we tried to, to, to some, some young players, because we were all playing traditional music. Mm -hmm. That's a way good. And loving play dances on the weekends. And but... Uh, I was always young players with adventures because you you're hearing you're hearing something else, something that uh, the society doesn't provide you. Mm. And uh, there was an incredible saxophone player in in, in Johannesburg, Kippy, mm. Kippy Moketsu. Um Incredible town. He started we started playing clarinet. And I mean, the, we used to play Mozart, clarinet, concerto, mm. you know, that, at that level. But these, the, you know, the conservatory, they were all uh, teachers in, this, in the townships mm -hmm. who had studied. And they studied with like, what's it, the, the Royal College of Music. Mm. So they gave us a very, very good grounding in, 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 in a in a technical aspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we tried to to, to, to create uh, uh, another, another direction. Uh, I think of it as an ancient tradition with new relevance. Mm. Now, how can we take that ancient tradition and, and develop it and make it relevant? Uh, but we had to find the, the musicians who were Firstly, sympathetic with the idea, and also uh, technically capable, uh, a passion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Kippy, 
the Kids of Saxophone player was first. And then you, Mr. Keller, Jonas Bwanga, the bass player, Johnny Getz, and Makaya and Chokoya. That was the third group that we created. It was in late, late uh, 50s, early the 60s. Late 1960, yeah. I think. That's what I read. That's when you recorded the first album. And it's yeah. the first real jazz record recording in South yeah. Africa? Yeah. Wow. Um, how did you come up with the name Dollar Brand? Where, where did that come from? What does it mean? For you, <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, at least ten different stories. Of that <laughs> okay, I don't know tell us one of them. <laughs> uh, 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 Cape Town, Cape Town seaport. Mm -hmm. So that time there was a, a, a shipping was before. That sounding ancient. You know? This was before regular airline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The shipping lines, so these uh, commercial shipping and passenger shipping to, from from to the UK to to the east, to the states, and there was a line. Uh, uh, this was a commercial commercial vessel vessel called uh, African Sun, African Star, and they were they were manned by African American seamen. Mm. And when they landed in Cape Town, we used to go to the Cape Town Harbour and invite them in our communities. Mm. So I'm hanging out with these people, that's why I got the name from Dollar. Mm. Yeah, Dollar. Interesting. So, early 60s, you come, you go to Europe and you're touring, you meet Duke Ellington. And it sounds like he becomes a mentor, and not only a mentor, but a presenter. And what was that like for you? I mean, you subbed for him on some of his performances, I read. Yeah. Um, what was that like for you? Were you, were you? Was he one of your heroes when you were? Influences? Yeah, well, for us in, like, in South Africa, Ellington was never an American. You know, he was just a, the wise old man in the village. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, musically, there's mm -hmm. contemporary music now, whether it's jazz music or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can't escape Ellington. Mm -hmm. One way, <laughs> you, you have to go through there. So we we studied Ellington's music and listened to listened to his records and. As uh, much as possible, try to analyze what he was doing. So when we met uh, met him in uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. that's why I, I met a lot of the, the American musicians for the first time because they were touring, yeah. you know, staying in Switzerland. I don't know. So the experience with Ellington was uh, the. Just confirmation because there are so many questions. <laughs> questions <laughs> about him. The, he, uh, one of the things that he told me was that uh, he had written a <coughs> pardon, mm -hmm. he had written a ballet, mm -hmm. and we were talking about this uh, this principle, the principle of the principle of water, and one of the mm -hmm. composition of water from an ancient well. The, the importance of water in our, in our lives, you know. mm. especially coming from, a, like all of us, from a, a hunter-gatherer uh, experience. Mm -hmm. right? So he told me that he had written a, a ballet of one drop of water, experienced one drop of water in, in the stillness of the lake, mm. the meander of the river, and the movement in the ocean. I think maybe this ballet has, has been performed, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me about Peter Abrams. Peter Abrams was a South African uh, writer who went into exile in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I told him that uh, I didn't know, personally know Peter, but I had read some of his work. And he, he left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he passed on, we discovered that he had written a 26-movement uh, uh, suite mm -hmm. dedicated to 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 Peter. To Peter wow! I think at some some point we will try to retrieve this and, and, and perform it. You know? mm. Wow! Yeah. So, um, 1965. You move to New York City. It's right in the heart of the civil rights movement here. Did that have an impact on how you were thinking about your music? How did that impact you? 
Yeah, it was long before we came here. Mm -hmm. so, that's why I say the, the experience of the African uh, African American experience through, through the church, through the AME church. Mm, right. And and we also sat up uh, in the middle of the night on radio, listened to Joe Louis fight mm. and celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were fortunate also that we were exposed to, to the to the to the experience and the, uh, and the, and the culture with, uh, with uh, Langston Hughes and the boy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, the regime tried uh, to keep all these things away from us, but whereas some young people were very resourceful, they could find you anything. <laughs> well, talk to me a little bit about Mannenberg. It becomes the anthem for the anti-apartheid movement. Were you thinking that that was going to happen when you oh, were working? Yeah, no, yeah, no idea. What, were you at the, and when, when I hear it, it's so spiritual. It's, it's like, does that part of how you're thinking of the music when you're... No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every musician, we think that every song that we write is going to sell a million, you know, it doesn't look like that. Yeah. You know? but, uh, we, were in, we were in Cape Town in the studio. I had a, a group of young musicians and I had uh, arranged about, I think, six, seven songs. And we were recording, and uh, during the during the break, there was a little upright piano because I was playing on a, on a grand piano. There was mm -hmm. a little upright piano standing in the corner, and I went over to it in the first the first one. I touched it, mm -hmm. but it, it had a, a very strange sound because in the township those years, what they used to do, they uh, you know up. Uh, Upright piano, the strings are like that, and, and the hammers hit this way. Mm -hmm. So they put a drawing pin or thumbtacks on the hammer. So when the hammer hits the string, you get this metallic sound. Oh, okay. Interesting. And so that first phrase came in, and then we had a little breach, and the musicians picked it up, mm -hmm. and we asked the, the, the engineer to roll it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we played it. Mm. One take. Mm. And it was about seven, 15 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went back to practice or record the other stuff. And then we said, well, wait a minute, something had happened there. Can, can you play back? And when we listened to the playback, we realized that we had captured the mood mm -hmm. at that time because it was at the time of the so-called Soweto uprising yeah. where people were arrested and people were being shot down all over the all and one of the, um, this was uh, the forced removals mm -hmm. where people were moved from traditional, where we lived traditionally, we were moved to, to, to new townships. So in Cape Town, in the center of Cape Town, there was a, an area called District 6, which mm -hmm. was in the city. So these people were forcibly removed. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, township that they were moved to was, was uh, Manenberg. So we were in the studio and all of this was happening outside, and, you know, police and people being shot down. And we said, okay, well, let us dedicate this to, to the spirit mm. of, uh, of, of the movement. And, uh, we recorded it and then we took it to all the record companies and uh, nobody wanted it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a little record shop in Johannesburg which is right in the heart of uh, of uh, the bus terminus. The buses come from all over, all mm -hmm. over the township into the city. And we had a little record shop there and we, we made copies and played it over the loudspeakers. We sold like 40,000 in two weeks. Wow. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. uh, I think we captured the mood. Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it became the unofficial uh, National anthem. anthem. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so let's jump ahead to what you're doing now. What's the inspiration for the new recording? And talk a little about the musicians that might be play that are playing with you this evening, and what you're gonna, what these people are gonna hear tonight. Well, 
Eu deixei que eu estou predictivo. We are jazz musicians. Uh -huh. Well, let's start with the first. Tell us about the inspiration for well, the record. Well, if I tell you what I'm going to play, we better go home. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, we. A group of uh, musicians, some of them have been with me. Cleve, uh, sax alto player, been with me. We've been together about 30 years because I first started this project in 1983 mm -hmm. in New York. And musicians like Ben Riley, uh, uh, Ricky Ford, Charles Davis, Eubank, you know. Mm -hmm. They became like an institution. Uh, mm -hmm. I call the project Ekaya. Ekaya means home. home. Yeah. So the band tonight, uh, Cleve, and then uh, alto, alto player, alto flute player, uh, Lance Bryant, tenor, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Andre Murchison, trombone, um, Marshall McDonald, uh, baritone, Noah Jackson, uh, uh, bass and uh, cello, mm -hmm. and Will Terrell on drums. Uh, most of them, like the horn players, they also play in the Basie band, mm. Basie and Ellington band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have this uh, uh, continuity of uh, mm. of uh, experience and, and, and learning. Mm -hmm. so, um, so thematically, we have <laughs> the. Yeah, Achebe said things fall apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. the everybody understands what is happening with the music industry, like everything else has been turned on its, on its mm -hmm. head because of, of, of modern technologies. People can't keep up with it. The, one of our last, my last recordings uh, was piano, cello, mm -hmm. and woodwinds. But it, it took me 60 years to, to get the record company to mm. record, record it. So, and it started here in Philadelphia. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's just like your second home. Yeah. We, we, thank you. <laughs> uh, I had Callow Scott on mm -hmm. cello. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, uh, cello, cello in the music was almost like uh, unheard of. Uh, it was in, in the downbeat poles, it was considered as a miscellaneous instrument. <laughs> <laughs> At Callow Scott, and Callow was really, and cello is really, really incredible cello player. He introduced, introduced us to Kodai, mm -hmm. the music of the Kodai is cello suite, and that music resonated with us because of, of the harmonic approach that mm -hmm. Kodai had. So I had Callow and Scott, and by Lancaster. Oh, yeah. On, uh -huh. on, on, on the bass clarinet. Yeah. And uh, we were in New York and we rehearsed and we went to, I went to a club and asked them for a gig. I said, I've got a trio. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, I'm going to book you for a week. When we turned up there the first night, they didn't want to pay us. Mm. Because they said, that's not a trio. A trio is bass, drums. <laughs> <and> <laughs> bass, drums, and piano. <laughs> so it took 60 years to try to convince them. You know, so we recorded this trio project last, last year. So we will present some of the of the songs. That's tonight. great. Let's open it up to some questions from yeah. some people out in the audience. So yes, yeah. sir. Uh, just a comment. Uh, Queenie Pie, mm -hmm. uh, Ellington's opera, mm -hmm. with uh, with the lyricist Peter Abram for performed once in Philadelphia. <laughs> hey, yeah. Yeah. So once. Yeah. And, uh, what's the, it? What's the call? Queenie Pie. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. poster was was drawn by. Well, Bearden, well, Bearden lived in the Chelsea Hotel with us. You know, right? But the, I think the Ellington Orchestra, after his death, actually recorded pieces of Queenie Pie. Mm -hmm. All right. But Ellington took the, took the lyrics from one of Abrams' books. Yeah. I think the home book, the one about going home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I just wanted to add that to your memory. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. May we exchange... Uh, Pleasantries, and mm -hmm. if you can help us uh, in this regard, I would like to follow that up. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the charts are with the Ellington organization? They should be with the Ellington organization because the long suite that you talked about, 
Yeah. Yeah. It was cut into an opera. It's almost as if somebody challenged Ellington and said you, you couldn't write an opera. Well, this is... And, and like years before, uh, challenged yeah. somebody else couldn't write an opera. And Ellington wrote this opera, but they only performed it once here in Philadelphia, which was quite a remarkable thing. Yeah. If we can, if we can uh, retrieve that, we would like to to, to present it, you know, and especially, yeah. especially in some of the South Africa. We hardly, hardly know that we sleep, and <laughs> it, it's it's no problem that uh, it's taken so long. The, when I started recording here in, in in New York and elsewhere. When we, we were considered avant-garde musicians, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so they recorded us at television programs, but when we saw and heard the end result, it was not what we played, mm -hmm. because they sanitized it, they cut up. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they monitored out what, what we are not supposed to be sounding like. You know? So I would like to follow that up with the Ellington project. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no, right there, yes, sir. Um, I uh, one of your compositions is a really beautiful blues for a hip tune. Yeah. Can you talk about your inspiration for that piece? Yeah, we lived in uh, Swaziland for some years. And we have a king, king, uh, king Sobuza. He was uh, the oldest reigning monarch. And he was a uh, it was quite something. He was hip. <laughs> 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 he was, he was, I said, let me write a song called the Blues for Hip. He was quite remarkable. He was a, a, I mean, a, a old spiritual leader, you know, ancient spiritual leader. I remember that uh, how many stories about him, but he was uh, with his motorcade. He was driving somewhere in Swaziland. And, he stopped the motorcade and, and told the security to go into the bush there because there were two guys with guns. <laughs> 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 so suddenly the security piece up and they say, excuse me, the king would like to talk to you. <laughs> 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 so there also there was a, a, a Swaziland borders, what is now called Mpumalanga. So there's a, there's a town called Nelspreit. There's a cave, uh, it's called Sudwala, a cave. Sudwala means a, a hole, hole in rock. Uh, I played a concert in this cave. Mm. It's quite an incredible cave. It's about the uh, capacity about 600. You know. oh my <laughs> it's quite incredible. When you go into the cave, like when you come out from, from the sunlight into some, some you know, places dark, it takes some time for you to, to, to be able to see it. But it's incredible when you come into total darkness and then this, this thing emerges here, it's a beautiful, like a cathedral. And apparently it has a, it has a lot of uh, tunnels. And the story is that uh, Sabuza used the, this uh, cave in times of conflict, that he took the nation up into this, uh, so when I was in Swaziland, I wrote this song for, for uh, I mean, it sounds a little strange writing for His Majesty or something, you know, but it's a blues for the hip king. You know. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great if you played tonight. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. I don't think you're taking requests, are you? <laughs> okay, okay, we'll, we'll okay. play it for you tonight. Okay. <laughs> in the back right there. A Niels Holt? Oh, you mean the discography? No, Niels Holt made a movie with you. Oh, Niels Holt, yeah, yeah. Have you seen that film? Many years ago. Yeah. Do you have it? I brought it for you tonight. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> it's very strange because you're, you're lying in bed totally dressed, smoking a pipe, and then someone walks up to you and says... There was nothing in the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> there was a prop. A pun? He has a very funny movie. He, he, uh, he fashioned, he thought of himself as a, as a, as a film director, you know, <laughs> but he was a hustler. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, right there. Um, can you say a little bit about what's going on with the scene now? I, I've been hearing some of these young players, Kyle Shepard, Indaduzo, folks like that. Um, can you say how how you are perceiving the music scene right now in South Africa? Well, it's no different than anywhere else. You know, I've got some young players with me. You know, my ba bass player Noah is 20, 22, 23 years of age. This new new generation of uh, of musicians, uh, Andre, the tr uh, trombone, trumpet player, also young, young person. Uh, we we imbue in them the the principle of ancient tradition, new relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the danger is now that uh, the the tradition is getting getting lost mm -hmm. because uh, we are probably still. Maybe uh, the last of the storytellers, because now everything is in sound bites. Mm -hmm. We don't have orators anymore. People speak in sound bites. Mm -hmm. So then in South Africa also we have a we have a project. Uh, we have a 800 hectare farm in the Kalahari that we are developing. For young young artists who be looking at it, you know, people to come on an international level because the most important most important part of of uh, of that uh, experience we think is really being on the earth, having your feet on the earth and experiencing experiencing this. Those of us uh, uh, in my generation, at least, we still had a bit of that experience of, of the land, to, and this possibility to be able to lock in. With, uh, with ourselves and with nature. The, the project that we have in the Kalahari, we are doing some, uh, we've been doing for some years work with, uh, with, uh, with the Bushman people. It's the last remaining people who still speak the language. The, they have also, next to the farm, about two hours drive from there, they've, they've created the SKA uh, project. SKA is the square kilometer array there's a radio telescope that looks into the looks into the universe. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's in the area because the that part of the world is one of the, the most stabilest uh, places in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we're doing this coordination between uh, uh, this year they uh, they graduated about 170 young astrophysicists. So we're looking at a at the new uh, another another dimension of how uh, we can get young people in, in, involved. Because if you our understanding, if you have to go to the to the market, you have to take something unique, and the uniqueness is to tell tell your story. Mm -hmm. So we have young people, and they're saying, "Tell us your story," and this is your. This is your product, and it's just sustainable, and it's also trans. It's transmittable. Right over there, yeah. Uh, there was another film about you, the brother with perfect timing, mm -hmm. and and there was a line you said in that I loved about um, being a sound scientist. <laughs> 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 and I, I try to, I try to give that to my students, like yeah. my little. Well, <laughs> they once asked Ellington, you know, Jimmy Hamilton, the clarinet player, the uh, tenor and clarinet. Now, all those musicians in the Ellington, Ellington band, somebody asked him, so why don't you leave the Ellington band? They said, where shall we go? The only place we can go is to the Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it was at, it was at that level. Mm -hmm. But they never made an issue of it. So Duke used to say that uh, Jimmy Ham, how did uh, how did this, it, okay, the story was there was a young African a, a child who was walking in, in the jungle, you know, <laughs> and then he came up on a clearing and sitting there uh, was was a, was a clarinet, and he picked up the clarinet and started playing these beautiful sweet sounds. Right. So this is the, the analogy is that. 
uh, it's assumed that we do not study. So, and it resonates right through the diaspora and the culture. I remember they once asked her, Muhammad Ali, they said, no, Ali, when, when you box, do you, do, you, do you actually train combinations of punches? He said, no, I just make it up as I go along. Which is actually the principle also the way that we play music, but we, we spend a lot of time practicing. Mm -hmm. A lot of time. Lot of, my musicians. So. Yeah. Please give a big round of applause for our, <laughs> our guest, Ali Ibrahim. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you.